Good morning, everyone. Sam and Sarah here. Um, for those of you that don't know us, Sam is our head of migration East Coast from Appian, and I'm the national chief of migration. Before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. In the spirit of reconciliation, Mappian acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So thank you for joining us today for what we hope will be an informative session. Um, we will be going through uh, the immigration related announcements from the budget, as well as outcomes to date and potential changes to come from the Jobs and Skills Summit, priority occupationist changes, processing direction and the new skills in demand visa. We will cover off on what has changed, the future direction of the employer sponsored programme. If you have any questions for today's chat, please pop your questions in the Q&A box and we will attend to it at the end of the session. Um, this is going to be a pretty content heavy session. There has been lots of changes over the last 12 months and the department has been keeping us very busy. So there's lots to discuss with you and uh, bear, bear with me. <laughs> so um, it has been a while since our last immigration webinar, but we have been keeping you updated on the changes to the visa program. So over the last 12 months, um, our last webinar spoke about the positive changes implemented by the government to assist with business and the pressures of filling skilled roles. The government continues to make some positive changes to the migration program. <clears throat> During the Jobs and Skills Summit in September 22, the Minister for Home Affairs, Claire O'Neill, announced a comprehensive review of Australia's migration system. The review of the migration system final report was delivered in March 2023, and I, I'm sure everyone remembers um, Minister O'Neill um, giving her big announcement like uh, Oprah Winfrey telling everyone was going to get um, permanent resident visa at the end of the year. So it was a much welcomed um, announcement from the government, um, but it also indicated that the system was so badly broken it required a 10 year rebuild. And I don't know if anyone was ever involved in the, the 2017 457 to 482 changes, but um, that was a massive, a massive change for everyone involved. So we're excited to see that the government have been um, conducting extensive consultations with business unions and other stakeholders. And the government released its migration strategy at the end of last year, which contained the government's vision for Australian migration. So the new vision for the Australia's migration system identified eight key actions. And this is where the minister announced in greater detail the new skills in demand visa which is intended to replace the 482 and help simplify the temporary skill migration program. It's important that we discuss these key eight issues today um, to understand what the government is aiming to achieve through the recent and upcoming changes. So first on the list was targeting um, the creation of the new skills in demand visa, which is expected to be in place in some shape or form at the end of this year, um, perhaps similar to the transitioned approach the department took with the 457 to 482 in 2017, 18. So this new framework is intended to make Australia more attractive to skilled international migrants, reducing their reliance on occupation lists to respond to the urgent skills shortage. As part of the review, the department has recently extended time period that the 482 visa holders have to find new employment while on shore. So um, you would have seen our post a few weeks ago um, leading up to the 1st of July. So visa holders now have up to 180 days after ceasing employment to secure a new role and sponsorship. Importantly and very generously, while they are searching for new work, they can work for any employer in any occupation without immediate sponsorship, ensuring they can earn an income during the crossover to the new employer. Streamlining LMT criteria is also on the agenda. We saw the removal of Workforce Australia last year, and I think we all did a little bit of a, a jig when we saw that announcement, because um, if anyone has dealt with that platform, um, we know it was pretty difficult to navigate. Um, and we note that there will be a longer validity period available for advertising. Um, a bill to introduce this change is currently before Parliament. So then there's a big fo focus on this permanent skill migration program. So we saw in November last year the reduction in the qualifying period for the 186 visa through the temporary residence transition stream, requiring the visa holder to have held the 482 visa for two years in the last three years while working in their nominated occupation. This has been a reduction from three years out of the last four. We also have the, the government um, working on shaping the new points tested visa, which is currently undergoing an overhaul. The third um, key action is strengthening the integrity and quality of international education. There has been plenty of media coverage on this topic with the highest number of student visa refusals we've seen for some time. 
Um, a crackdown on visa hopping has resulted in the 485 visa holders and visitor visa holders being unable to lodge student visa applications while onshore. This commenced on the 1st of July this year. And there's also been shorter stay periods um, applied to the 485 visa and an increase in the English language requirements for student visa applications. One of the big ones that we've seen lots of media coverage on recently is the tackling the worker exploitation and the misuse of the visa system. So new legislative powers, penalties and policies have been introduced to combat worker exploitation, including a proposed new public register of employer sponsors to improve integrity and support migration worker mobility. We will talk about this in more detail. So planning migration to get the right skills. So overall, the government really wants to drastically decrease net overseas migration, which I'll refer to as NOM, because it's quite wordy, um, in the next two years. Uh, permanent migration and the humanitarian programs are to remain largely unchanged with 24, 25 planning levels set at 185,000. So after a record post-COVID NOM intake um, of about 528,000 at the end of 23, the government aimed to reduce it to 375,000 by the end of June this year and to 260,000 by 2025. And my latest check on ABS yesterday as at December 23, NOM for end of June, or end of December, sorry, was 547,300. So still quite a way off of what they want to achieve. Um, and we'll probably start to see, which we've already seen, um, the uh, student visa refusals are coming in um, thick and fast. So the opposition has recently also announced its own target of 160 um, NOM, which is very interesting considering we're sitting above uh, 550 <laughs> for the closeout of last year. So we've also seen um, deepening of our people ties to the Indo-Pacific region. So we've got direct pathways to citizenship for New Zealanders and increased mobility with the Pacific Islands and Southeast Asian countries. And then we have a simplifying, simplifying of the migration system. So normally what happens there is the government will remove um, a couple of visa subclasses, but perhaps introduce a few new streams under a few new visa subclasses, which you'll start to um, hear about as we go through um, the webinar today as well. So that will provide you with some background into the changes currently afoot. So let's have a look at what has changed over the last 12 months. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, as there have been plenty of changes. Um, but we wanted to keep a key focus on what's changed around the employer-sponsored visa program. Um, but if there's others that you're interested in, we can take that offline later in the week. So we've had a TISMIT increase from 53,900 to 70,000 um, in 2023, which was the first increase in 10 years. Um, and we've had it indexed again to 73,150 um, as of the 1st of July this year. The department is considering annual indexation of this figure, which Sam will discuss in greater detail. Um, we've also seen, as I said earlier, um, the requirement to post on Workforce Australia was removed in December, which was much welcome news. Um, you only now require to run two job advertisements for a 28 day period to satisfy the labour market testing requirements unless you're exempted. We've also had the introduction under the free trade agreement for the UK and Malaysia, UK nationals and Malaysian nationals as part of the ITO exemptions have been added to the list as LMT exempt. So from the 1st of July as well, we've had the visa conditions 8107, 8606 and 8608 amended to allow 457, 482 and 494 visa holders a period of up to 180 days after ceasing employment with their sponsor to either be nominated by a new employer, apply for a new visa or depart Australia. Previously, these visa holders only had 60 days, which really isn't realistically enough time to secure a new role. So what does this actually look like in reality? So individuals will be able to cease working for a maximum total period of 365 days during their visa validity period, but no longer than 180 days for each period. What is beneficial for this cohort is that they can work for any employer in any role while seeking new sponsorship. Um, and this will allow them to support themselves and their families during this period. Um, for employers, it may also be beneficial um, to have them commence without delay while the sponsorship process is underway, including any labour market testing that needs to be conducted. So definitely a welcome change. The subclass 186 temporary residence transition stream was also subject to changes in November 23. These are the ones I was um, talking about earlier when Minister Claire O'Neill made her big announcement in March, April last year, um, where a very large cohort of um, permanent 
temporary migrants um, were ineligible for the 186 under the temporary residence transition stream due to the occupation list they fell upon. So from November last year, um, no matter your occupation and no matter what list you're on, if you're holding a 482, you're eligible to progress through the 186 pathway under the temporary residence transition stream. Um, this was a very welcome change for employers as it, as it allowed them to permanently retain the skills they needed. We've also had the introduction and establishment of the WA DAMA. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this, um, but if you would like more information after this session, we can um, provide that to you. But it was established on the 1st of July due to a strong demand that still exists from employers to fill jobs in WA. Um, the Cook and Albanese government signed a deal for 10,000 skilled migration places to be shared with the state nominated program and the new DAMA. So with the changes um, to the trade agreements, we had uh, last year the increase of the age limit for the UK passport holders um, when they're looking at applying for the working holiday visa. So now UK nationals can apply for the working holiday visa between the ages of 18 and 35 years, um, the same as Canada, Denmark, France, Ireland and Italy. Also, from the 1st of July this year, UK passport holders can be granted up to three separate working holiday visas without having to meet any specified regional work requirements, which is just, just amazing. Um, so we're really excited to see those start to come through. Um, then there's been a very heavy focus on worker exploitation and strengthening um, the protections available to migrant workers. So we've had the introduction an amendment to um, the Migration Amendment Strengthening Reporting Protections, so it's a bit of a mouthful, um, Regulations 2024, um, which strengthens the protections available to migrant workers who report workplace exploitation matters. Um, this commenced on 1 July this year and introduces, sorry, introduces a range of measures, including three important protections. So the protection against visa cancellation, flexible visa requirements for future sponsored visas, and a short-term visa to bring claims for wages that are owed and um, hold exploitive employers to account. There have been other measures that have been included. Um, we'll share those after the session in a client alert. Um, so you can uh, have a read of that in more detail as well. So with the introduction of the new migrant worker protection measures, um, that has created a new workplace justice visa. And this enables temporary migrants to remain in Australia for a period of time to undertake a workplace justice activity. So this visa uses the subclass 408 temporary activity visa stream. Um, the workforce justice visa will be implemented as a pilot um, and generally will be granted for six and up to 12 month period. It's only available to temporary migrants who have certification regarding workplace exploitation from a participating government entity or accredited non-government party. Um, this visa will also be available to any family members and it attracts a nil fee. Now, I won't go into detail on this slide because it doesn't really focus on employers, but I guess the key things to take away is that New Zealand citizens um, living in Australia are considered for PR from the date their triple four visa is granted. Um, so they don't have any need to actually make an application for permanent residency as long as they meet the resident criteria. And for students, the um, COVID uh, relaxation of working hours ceased last year um, and students are uh, restricted to working 48 hours a fortnight while courses in session. So as you can see, there's been plenty of consultation and implementation of changes undertaken by the department and Mappy and are really heavily involved in advocacy support around these changes. Um, I'll hand over to Samantha now where she'll take you through where the JSA and the government are at with this consultation process. Thank you, Sarah. And um, hello and welcome everybody from me as well. Great of you to take time out of your schedules to join us today. Um, so as Sarah said, I'll just talk through some of the stakeholder engagement that's been happening, consultations, give you a little bit of a um, reminder of what we know about the skills in demand visa and talk to the 403 visa pilot that's going on. But, you know, first and foremost, um, as you can see on this slide, let's have a quick chat about Jobs and Skills Australia and the draft core skills occupation list. So in line with the department's agenda for change, we have seen a, a good increase in engagement activities from the department. And that's always very welcome as change without consultation can often, you know, miss the mark and not deliver what's intended. So um, 
Engagement's been happening in areas including the proposed new occupation lists, regional migration, the points tested framework for independent skilled, which you know has had its own problems for a number of years. And more recently, there is um, consultation happening around a new migration amendment, strengthening sponsorship and nomination processes bill 2024. I'm sure our legislators always have a chuckle coming up with these titles. Um, so for those who may not be aware, Jobs and Skills Australia or JSA was established in 2022. And as a tripartite body, JSA has been formed to help define and address Australia's skill shortages. And immigration would just be one lever to help alleviate our shortages in the sort of, you know, short, medium and longer term. But it's an important one. It won't fix everything, but, you know, it certainly can help. So one of JSA's specific responsibilities initially has been determining what's called the annual skills priority list. And that priority list will then form the basis of the new core skills occupation list or CSOL. So if you've been working around immigration for as long as I have, you'll remember that we had a CSOL with the 457 that was replaced by our current multiple lists and it's making a comeback. So the new CSOL will apply to the core skills pathway of the skills in demand visa when that gets introduced. And for the CSOL in March, JSA released three draft lists for consultation. So the first list included occupations that it's confident will come off list. The second one was occupations that it's confident will remain on list. And then the third one, which is the one that we're super interested in, is the occupations that it would like further consultation on. It's, it hasn't really decided what to do with them yet. So the on list includes 183 occupations, and that covers C-suite, um, health, IT, engineering sectors, and quite a number of trades, which is good news because, you know, there has been an increase in the need for trades from overseas. And there are about 300 occupations still on the open for consultation list. And there is some crossover between on list and open for consultation as well. Um, but under the current TSS, we've got 430 occupations available for sponsorship for metropolitan businesses and then another 77 for regional employers. And I think we just need to be mindful that whatever they land on as the final list, it needs to be broad enough to allow employers to access, you know, a, a quite a large number of roles because they may not all be used frequently or in high volumes, but any list that restricts that middle tier of the skills in demand visa does have to have flexibility in it because, you know, we do all know that the needs of business can change quite rapidly in the in the local labour market. So we have no real insight into JSA's methodology yet. It has indicated that it will release more details on that sort of through later this year. But for now, it also has indicated that it will have a heavy reliance on data sets produced by different government departments. And in the submission that we put through, we did say that, you know, while data is important, we do appreciate it, it's very valuable, um, there should be equal weight given to the actual experience of business sponsors because, you know, data won't capture what's really happening in the business world. Um, and, you know, we really want to see a new program that is simple as intended, but that also is, again, flexible enough to respond to, to business needs. So we probably want to know how frequently this CSOL will be updated or is able to be updated. So JSA did email this morning to get permission for publishing our submission on the website, and um, I imagine that they'll be um, publishing all of those around the second week of August. So if you're interested in, in finding out a bit more about what, what that might look like, go onto the JSA website mid-August and you'll get, get some details there. And we're happy to share as well. So then that brings me to the current consultation process, which is being run by the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, Committee, sorry. And this committee has been tasked with seeking feedback on the draft 
Migration Amendment Bill, which I mentioned just before. I won't say it again because it's quite a tongue twister. Um, so we recently received an invitation to provide a submission on this bill as well, and we've been seeking feedback from our clients to help formulate a response. So the bill will introduce measures designed to help strengthen sponsorship and nomination processes and to an extent to restore confidence in and ensure the integrity of the migration programs. It will make four main amendments, including the introduction of the income thresholds for the skills in demand visa, which I'll come back to in more detail on the next slide. In addition to embedding the thresholds in the migration regulations, the bill will also legislate for the annual indexation of the minimum salary threshold that Sarah mentioned just before. So. This is the threshold that will apply to the core skills stream or the middle stream of the skills in demand visa. Bill is proposing that the average weekly time earnings figure published by the ABS for each annual period be the figure that's tied to the indexation. And it sounds simple enough, but that figure for this year was 4.1%, um, which is why we had a jump in intismate from 70 to 73,150. If we had the same amount next year, the threshold would increase again to just over $76,000 base. Um, and that's the salary that would need to be paid before an occupational position would be eligible for sponsorship. So our concern is that increases to this level year on year would be unsustainable for quite a lot of small and medium businesses that need to access the program. And it could very well also create an environment where sponsored employees are being paid more than their Australian counterparts, particularly given that local salary increases aren't um, purely determined by ABS data. You know, there's a range of factors that go into play and size of the business also needs to be factored in. And the department for a number of years has been concerned that sponsored temporary workers are paid less than their counterparts. <laughs> I'm sure they're not trying to purposefully create an environment where they're being paid more. Um, so the third amendment will be a step in the right direction for labour market testing. Again, as Sarah mentioned, the validity period for job ads will extend out to six months. Currently, it's four. Um, really good change because, you know, it's very easy for that time to tick over while you're negotiating a contract and, you know, before you're ready to submit an application. So I can already hear the size of relief. It's not in just yet, but it will be coming. So... Then we move to the fourth and the final amendment, which is a really interesting one. Um, it would see the creation of a public register of sponsors to be included on the Doha website. And um, the department's indicating that this would include the details listed here. So the business name, ABN, postcode, number of individuals nominated and the occupations of any nominated workers. And um, we've had mixed feedback from clients on this so far as well, and, you know, it's certainly an interesting idea. So the intention is that the register will help tackle abuses of the visa system and facilitate the mobility of migrant workers amongst approved sponsors. So for me personally, I can't see that the public register will um, really provide any substantial help in tackling abuses. Um, the, the best way for immigration to deal with that is investing more heavily in monitoring and compliance activities. That, that sort of should be a no-brainer, I would think. Um, and, you know, we've provided feedback on that occasions before, and we'll, we'll mention that again in this next submission. But... Um, can see that it might help spon uh, sponsored workers find new employment if they're made redundant. You know, sometimes that's through no fault of their own. It could be a business acquisition or change in market conditions. And, you know, if they can clearly see that there are businesses in their um, area of expertise that have sponsored workers before, it would make sense that they might reach out to those, those places to see if there are opportunities. But, you know, a concern raised by a client, um, quite validly is that, you know, it could create just an extra burden for the people that are working in those areas within the business having to, you know, field unsolicited queries. Um, but also concern, which I think is quite valid, is that, you know, sponsors having their details published could well become the subject of unwarranted 
attention, um, unwanted attention from other parties. So it could be unions who are not fans of temporary skilled sponsorship, you know, trying to access a business that previously they've had no interest in, could be scammers as well. So, you know, we've certainly had cases of visa applicants being victims of phishing campaigns and, you know, individuals pretending to be Doha officers, asking them to make a payment to avoid their visa being cancelled. Um, some people pay, unfortunately, you know, and they're, they're a very vulnerable sector. So we just wouldn't like to see an unintended consequence where business sponsors become targets for these kind of activities either. So um, we have reached out to clients to get feedback. So, you know, if you've joined us today and you, you haven't received a communication from us asking for your feedback and opinion, let us know. More than happy to um, incorporate any feedback into our submission. It is due late next week. So if it is of interest to you, just let us know sooner rather than later and we'll send you some details. So then that takes me to the Skills in Demand visa. Um, first announced December last year, must be the most anticipated visa I've seen in around 20 years, given the build-up and all of the promises made about how wonderful it will be. Um, it will replace the 482 later this year, although potentially maybe expect early 2025. There's a lot of work going on in the background and a lot to pull together. So any delays probably wouldn't be surprising. And, you know, if that means getting it right, then, you know, I'm sure we're all happy to wait. So promising to see the department take its time as well, because, you know, policy and legislation on the run rarely delivers what it's intended to. So from what we've been told to, to date, what we know is that it will see a return to a four-year stay period as a standard, regardless of which pathway is applied for, which is really great because the current, you know, two years or four years, depending on your occupation, is really not very useful. Um, the department has undertaken to deliver a median processing time of seven days for the specialist skills stream, although this part makes me laugh. It's only for the first 3,000 positions approved under that stream every year. After that, we're not quite sure what the intention is, but we expect that it will default to a median processing time of 21 days, which is what will apply to the um, core skills and essential skills streams. So... All skills in demand visa holders will have a pathway to permanent residence. Um, and it has been proposed that any time spent with any approved employer will support permanent residence eligibility. So this presumably will go towards the temporary residence transition stream. And, you know, it this will be a great change if it happens because it's very problematic for employees if they have to reset their PR eligibility clock when they change employers. And again, it may be that there are redundancies, business acquisition, something changes, and you know, they're almost at the two years where they would be able to apply, but they have to start again. So, you know, we'd really welcome this one coming in. It will also be very helpful for visa holders who might be nearing the 45 year age cutoff for a permanent application. Um, so three streams, we've touched on this before, and you probably will have potentially heard about this. So we will have a specialised skills stream. So this will be for people who the department consider a highly specialised um, earning over $135,000 per year. So there won't be an occupation list applied for, for this cohort of people. Um, and just be aware that, you know, the 135 per annum presumably will be base again. So they're guaranteed earnings, no super, no um, performance-based bonuses or commissions or amounts that aren't agreed in advance. Interestingly, the department uh, has said that even though it's open to all occupations, it will exclude trades workers, machinery operators and drivers and labourers. So not quite sure on the reasoning for that because, you know, certainly I've seen some very highly paid trades workers in my time and particularly in the last few years with shortages driving up wages. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why they wouldn't be recognised as highly skilled. Um, core skills stream. So this is the middle stream. 
And this is the one that will have the new um, core skills occupation list as defined by JSA that applies. It will also have the core skills income threshold applied, currently 73,150. So this will operate very much like the 482. It will have a minimum threshold. Um, you have to be at or above to meet it. Um, so anyone on, on the occupation list between 73,150 and 135 would fall in here. And then we have essential skills stream. So this one we don't really know a lot about just yet, but will be for occupations that are still needed in the labour market, but where the salary level would be below the um, TISMIT or CSIT. So, you know, it might come across to cover sectors like childcare, aged care, um, anyone providing an essential service where the salaries are a little bit lower. The minister will have the power to determine the amount that applies to this stream. So, or the method that can be used to calculate the salary that applies to this stream. It's possible we'll see the introduction of more labour agreements that are specific to the industries where, where workers might fall in this category. I'm hoping there'll be flexibility if there are enterprise agreements in place that um, employers don't need to enter into a labour agreement if they've got an enterprise agreement that's been, you know, agreed to and negotiated with their employees. Because if you've dabbled in the labour agreement space, you will know they take a very long time to get approved and a whole lot of work for everyone involved. Um, there has been suggestion that the department will also consider just amending how it collects employer fees. So the Skilling Australians Fund levy might be collected annually rather than upfront. Um, that administratively may be difficult for the department, but certainly it would be better for employers to not have to pay a full year SAF levy and have someone leave after, after six months or so. Um, and also potential for skills in demand visa holders to have access to um, a self-nominated independent pathway, but we don't have detail on what, what that would look like as yet. So skills in demand, that's what we know so far. We'll keep you updated as we find out more. Um, but this one, this is a really good one for people to be aware of. I have to admit, I knew the pilot was in place, but I hadn't looked into it in too much detail as yet. But um, I had a briefing with DFAT's Free Trade Agreements and Stakeholder Engagement Division a couple of weeks ago um, where they were just talking through what this pilot looks like and how it can be used. And it was, it was really interesting, and I think a lot of our clients would benefit from being aware of this and also using it where it's relevant. So DFAT is running a pilot program which has been enlivened by the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement and it's referred to as the Innovation and Early Careers Skills Exchange Pilot. It's not new, first opened up last year, but a recent decision was made to continue with it and um, double the amount of places have been allocated for this financial year. So there are 2,000 spots available for UK nationals. Eligible individuals are granted a subclass 403 visa with full work rights and the period of stay is determined by the pathway. So these effectively are almost like a 482 visa, except this is the good news. There's no requirement for sponsorship, no labour market testing and no minimum salary. So DFAT has said that the pilot would be perfect for intercompany transfers and graduates, and that it clearly might also be an attractive option for employers given it's a low cost alternative to the 482. Both pathways need a job offer. They don't allow for the inclusion of family members, so that could be a deal breaker, um, and they won't allow the visa holder to change employer in Australia. They both pathways also require the applicant to show at least $5,000 in savings. So for the early careers stream, there's a 12-month stay available. They can be renewed and they can be applied for from within Australia. So if you've got people onshore that might fit in this category, um, they can look at doing an onshore request as well. So they need to be between 21 and 45 for early careers. They need to have a relevant qualification, which could be 
tertiary university level, or it could be a trade technical qualification. And they need to have at least three months experience in an occupation that falls within ANSCO skill level one to three. It's, it could be a good alternative to the 407 training visa as well, because, you know, there's no formal nomination um, training program required. So if you're thinking about bringing someone over for 12 months of training, then I'd consider this one as well. Turnaround time is between seven and 14 days, which is really nice. And then the innovation stream. So this requires an individual to show a, I like this, demonstrated commitment to innovation in their career. And I don't know about anyone else, but innovation, I think, must be one of the hardest things to try and quantify, like how you innovate. Um, but And they also need to show, yeah, highly skilled and highly experienced. So DFAT has indicated that its own definition of innovation is quite broad and can be found on their website, although I haven't found it yet. Um, People, this is restricted to occupations at ANSCO skill level one. This one processing takes a little bit longer because it's a merits-based assessment and at least 50% of a candidate's potential score is linked to their innovation and then at least 25% equally is, is allocated to their skills and their experience. And this one requires them to sort of... Um, provide statements in their own words of, you know, how they are highly skilled, how they are highly experienced, how they have innovated. So a um, little, little bit more work involved, but um, the, the project officer who I met with did indicate that they don't have a lot on hand at the moment. So processing should be quite fast if anyone would like to apply for one of these, um, particularly when you think that it's a three year, up to three year visa, with really minimal costs and no formal sponsorship. Um, I think we need to probably consider this a bit more to keep our dear friends at DFAT gainfully and actively employed. <laughs> um, there is also a new skills development exchange pilot in place under our um, free trade agreement with Indonesia. We haven't put details in this slide because it's quite new. Um, it will go for five years, but this one is for workplace-based um, placements based on a business to business exchange. So you don't need people going both ways, but there needs to be some, some relationship in place between, you know, the business in Indonesia and the business in Australia and vice versa. So um, 200 places inbound um, this year, but it's only open, unlike the UK pilot, which is open to all sectors, the Indonesian pilot is only open to agriculture, mining, green industries, creative economies, which does include film and gaming, and IT programming. So keep it in mind. Really great. It's like a bit of a golden egg kind of pilot, I think. Um, so then that brings me to just the last, last part from me, which is really about um, what you need to do, I guess, given it's a big year of change that's already happened and still to come. And, you know, certainly there's a lot for people to keep on top of. That's what we're here for. Obviously, we can help with that. But um, I think for anyone who's um, using these, particularly the employer sponsored programs, I think, you know, key recommendations would be stay up to date on the changes. Um, stay on top of what's happening with the new skills in demand visa. You know, we'll provide updates as they're released, but Doha website's quite good. Look out for the minister's announcements. You know, they, they tend to sort of issue new media releases as they get clearer on detail. So just, just make sure you're aware of it. Um, plan ahead as much as you can. So if you've got people eligible for permanent residence under the current programs, if, if they've sort of, you know, put out feelers with you on, on whether you would support that, have a think about it um, from time to time. Well, as Sarah mentioned, the 457 to 482 changeover, that one did result in some people no longer being eligible. I don't think that would happen this time, but you know, with the amount of change that's coming, it does create a lot of anxiety for temporary visa holders. So I think if you can, if you're willing to support someone who's eligible for permanent residence now, you know, it would, um, the goodwill, 
you probably can't pay for from, from doing that with them. Um, that also means it's a good opportunity to think about just defining or redefining generally your internal policies around permanent sponsorship. So there has been a reduction in places for independent skilled migrants for this program year, which runs through to 30 June. And um, in contrast, we've had more places put into the employee nomination scheme for this year. So I think you'll you'll get a lot more people asking about um, employer nomination. So just have a think about when you're willing to support the applications. Would you like people to work for a certain minimum time period before you make that further investment? And, you know, what will you consider paying for? Because there's a bit more flexibility around who needs to meet what costs when you get to a permanent um, pathway. Be compliant. Um, compliance is just it's such a wonderful thing. I love it. People laugh at me when I say I love compliance and policy, <laughs> um, but super important. So make sure you do a sanity check, you know, take stock of your record keeping practices. Do you remember what you need to keep track of, what you need to advise the department of? One thing that, that we'd ask people to keep an eye on is what happens after you have a temporary visa holders start employment. And this is 482 visa holders. So we have found from time to time that we'll have a request come through for a permanent residence application. And when we're assessing the permanent um, eligibility, we'll find out only then that the person's occupation has changed from when their visa was first approved. And, you know, if they're no longer working in their approved occupation, that creates a breach for both the sponsor and the visa holder. Um, where it's an upward, potentially sideways promotion, it's not too difficult to deal with, but best to avoid that kind of um, circumstance. So again, do you need, you know, further training or education within the business, perhaps to a broader range of stakeholders and could be hiring managers or business unit managers, just so they're aware of what they have to consider when they're looking at a, at a temporary visa holder, um, a change in role, location, whatever it, it may be. Um, and just very quickly back to the 403 pilot, like, you know, if you're looking at candidates out of the UK, just have a think, is this, this an option for us that might be faster, cheaper, um, you know, less onerous from, from the record keeping perspective as well, if we can get them on board and approved. So um, that's all from me. I'll hand you back to Sarah just for a quick summary of what's still to come. Um, thank you again for listening and um, we'll come to questions in a little while. I think we've got a couple sitting in there waiting. Great. Thank you, Sam. And I don't know about everybody, but I'm exhausted just listening to that. It's no wonder we're all tired. <laughs> Um, so we're going to just take a final look and this is the final slide. So hang in there. We'll go to questions after this. Um, so we're looking at what changes are going to be implemented towards the end of this year and into 2025. So um, we know that there is going to be a work experience reduction um, to the 482 visa. Currently, it's sitting at the candidate must have at least two years of relevant work experience in the last five. That is full time from the 23rd of November this year. That will be reduced to 12 months. Um, we're assuming it's going to be applied across um, all people who will be applying for the 482 visa, but we'll keep you posted on that front. As we've been mentioning, the labour market testing um, advertising period is um, increasing to six months from four, which is a welcome change. Uh, we have the annual indexation of um, TISMIT, which, as Samantha's mentioned, um, is currently sitting at 73,150, could, but could potentially continue to increase um, at that rate of potentially 4% each year. So something to keep an eye on and, and monitor. That not only applies to your 482 visa cohort, but also those who are applying for a 186 employer-sponsored PR. And then we have the development of the skills in demand visa, which Samantha has taken us through. And I'm actually quite excited to see what that looks like and how it's going to play out. Um, so we've also had the introduction um, and a well, hopeful introduction towards the end of the year uh, of the uh, independent skill migration reforms um, to help better identify migrants who drive Australia's long term prosperity. Um, and the government are looking at the points tested system in the hope that it will provide a faster pathway to permanent residency. 
Um, there's also been chatter about a new national innovation visa, which will be implemented towards the end of 24, replacing the global talent visa. Uh, and this is going to target exceptionally talented migrants. We've also um, will have in 2025, a new work and holiday visa for China, Vietnam, India through a ballot process. Uh, it's also been mentioned that the Philippines will be included in this program in the near future. So that's not confirmed as yet, but there's definite chatter around that. There's a new professional visa for Indian national graduates with specific knowledge and skills allowing for 3000 places and can work up to two years. That will be introduced uh, sometime in 25. And as Sam's already mentioned, we've got the 403 pilot program. So it's going to be a year of change, um, a lot of it. Um, with the government undertaking thorough research on the labour market as it starts to form policy settings for the new skills in demand visa and focus on ensuring Australia is set up to succeed in meeting their five core objectives. And those five objectives are a better living standards for all, a fair go for all, building a stronger Australian community, strengthening international relationships and making the system work. So Sam and I thank you for your time and attention today and we will open the floor to questions in the Q&A box. Let me get this Q&A box working. Does anyone have any questions for us? Yeah. I've got one here. Um, yeah. Skills in demand visa processing time of seven days is for accredited or all? And is there a specific time frame? That is a very good question. That level of detail we don't have just yet. Um, I would think that the, um, I mean, there are other benefits to holding accreditation as a, as a sponsor. So um, it may be that it standardizes faster processing for that specialist skills stream. And then in the core skills, you might still get faster processing if you're accredited. But yeah, we just, just don't have that level of detail now. Um, the skills in demand will lead to permanent residence. So that, that's been mentioned that um, there will be that, that pathway available. Hmm. The, 40, um, the 403 doesn't lead to permanent The 403 residence. doesn't, no. no. Hmm. People can still apply for PR with a 403 um, if they're eligible, like independent pathways, for example, but it won't feed them into the temporary residence transition stream. Um, they could potentially apply for a direct entry employer nominated if they met that criteria, but it's not by definition a feeder into the 186 pathway. I've got another one here, Sam. So skills in demand visa. So media is stating that there is um, 21 days for processing and seven days for the specialist skills stream. Could you just um, explain again the 3000 positions in that <laughs> tier one? <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> I'm not sure I can, to be honest. Um, the information provided is just that there will be seven day processing, but only up to 3000 positions a year. So I'm assuming that there'll be a tracking mechanism and once it gets to that 3,000, then, you know, they'll default to the longer processing time. I have no idea what the rationale is there, um, given the specialist skills stream is, is meant to be very fluidly responding to business needs. It might be capacity. Um, maybe the department's not sure yet exactly how many applications will fall within that specialist skills stream based on... Um, salary, like it may end up that they've got far more applications sitting in that cohort than they anticipated and, you know, they can't deliver on seven days for everyone. It's, um, it, it's, I would love to have a crystal ball or be a fly on the wall in the meetings where these sorts of things are discussed because some of them, you know, are quite, quite interesting. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay, we've got another one here for LMT. When is that expected to increase to six months? We believe that's towards the end of this year. So we might hear something around November, December this year. So for now, it's business as usual. So mm. that's your, your two advertisements running for 28 days um, and they can't be older than four months old. Yeah, the Senate committee will report back on the draft bill, I think to September is the due date for the Senate report. So... Um, the six months increase is embedded in the draft 
bill that's currently being considered. So if they report back September, I think there's often a legislation update in November. So maybe November at the earliest, but um, you know, it's still, it's been through a second reading in parliament, but it still has to go through its third and then be accepted. So a few months away, but something to look forward to. It'll be like an early Christmas present. That's mm, definitely, <laughs> I can't wait to see them get rid of it, but that's in my uh, Christmas wish list. <laughs> Mm. um so we've got another question here around the 403 pilot um would this work well for skills such as physiotherapists yeah I think so Mark I think the pathway would probably be determined by the level of experience um I think the early careers pathway might be a good one just thinking out loud um the innovation pathway may be difficult just in the context of of them articulating how they've innovated in their career although you know i'm sure we've got some very innovative physios out there as well but um i, I think it's certainly worth having a look at if if, if it's something of interest for sure hmm. Um, oh, the question around age limit. Um, we've not seen anything in respect of um, an increase in age limit for the employer-sponsored 186 visa. Currently, that is set at 45 years of age. There is an exemption to the age criteria under the temporary residence transition stream, um, whereby the individual needs to have held their 482 for two years. Um, while earning the fair work high income threshold um, over that two year period. So they would need to provide PAYG summaries and pay slips to be able to demonstrate that fair work income threshold. And um, that's currently set as of 1 July this year at 175,000. Um, so that, that would be the only exemption there. So if you do have a candidate who is nearing their 45th birthday and you wish to sponsor them for PR, now is probably the time to have a look to see if they're eligible um, before their 45th birthday. Um, if not, then they would need to do two years on the 482 and apply under that TRT stream, but they must be earning over that two years the fair work high income threshold. So it could count a lot of people out. Uh, yes, we will share the slides at the end of today's session. Um, we've also got a, a client alert that we'll share too, and we'll provide um, responses to the questions in the chat box as well. Um, okay, another question here. How does the implementation of the skills and demand visa impact on existing assignees with 482 visas? Um, will it only impact you know, new applicants who are applying or, or perhaps renewals as well? That's a really great question. Um, I guess <laughs> I'm scarred from um, previous legislative changes when we we move from the 457 to the 482. I still get a twitchy eye when I'm thinking about it. But um, what, what happened back then is that the, the government at the time made these slapdash changes and applied all the changes retrospectively to um, applications that were lodged but were undecided and it wiped out quite a huge amount of people's eligibility for for PR um, it was an extremely distressing time for a lot of people so I'm hoping um, this Labour government has learned from those mistakes and there will be some sort of um, grandfathering or concessions available around that transition um, from the 482 to the skills in demand visa I think like we had with the 457 where the person's at 457 was expiring and they just made an application for the 482 if they met the 482 criteria the same will apply for 482 visa holders um, progressing into the next phase of that skills in demand as well. Sam, do you have any comments on that? No, I think I think that that's probably mm -hmm. yeah, exactly what people what will happen. Know. Yeah. I am um, I think the department has learnt and I'm I'm quite sure there was comment made that changes won't be retrospective when they occur this time around. So mm -hmm. You know, let's let's hope that that's that's definitely the case. Um, Mark, just coming back to your comment, um, yeah, early career I think would be perfect for physio candidates. Obviously, just be mindful of whatever APRA registration they may need um, to come in to to do that work. But definitely, if they've got the qualifications and they've got the three months work experience and they're of the right age, um, perfect opportunity for sure. Yeah, if they're coming in for the UK too, Mark, they have the, the option of looking at the work and holiday visa too, which they can have for up to three three years without having to do regional work. I guess the only caveat with that is they can only work with you for, for six months 
um, on the working holiday visa. Yeah. Let us know, Mark, if we can help because I'm very keen to keep our DFAT friends fed. <laughs> <laughs> Very keen to see them deliver on their seven seven or so day turnaround as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're a good group. They're, they're well resourced. You know, um, Simon, who I met with, said they've got, you know, a good team in place ready to go. So, you know, I've, I did feel like we should be, you know, helping them promote the pilot because, you know, the pilot needs to be successful to then be picked up as a permanent option and, um you know, the UK Free Trade Agreement provides the flexibility that's in place with it. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good one for people to use if they can. Yeah, I did a 403 recently under the foreign government stream and that was approved in a day. So if that's yeah. the same group who are processing those, maybe not, but um, they're pretty fast. Don't yeah. hold me to it. <laughs> so I think that's all our questions for now that I can see in the chat. Hopefully we've gotten to answer everyone's questions. Oh, um, Julianne, I see you've raised your hand. Do you want to pop your question in the chat because there's no, I guess, facility to to speak with quite a number of people online? Um, or uh, we can take your query offline and you can give us a buzz later. Um, our contact details are there on the screen. Here we go. Beautiful. Okay. Um, I'm interested to know more about the eligibility of New Zealand citizens or residents to be employed on a permanent basis within government. Um, my understanding is that for a person to be employed within government is that they need to be a permanent resident or a permanent citizen of Australia. Good question, Julianne. Do you, I've got a couple of minutes, so if people are happy to hold on the line, we can answer that question. I I'll probably will need to revert back to my um, slides to cheat because <laughs> I haven't looked at this for a little while. Yeah, but I um, think so the yes. um, sorry, Sarah. I was no, go ahead. Yeah, you, Julianne, I think the kind of treatment, for want of a better word, for New Zealand citizens being considered permanent residents is purely tied into the Australian citizenship regulations. In that, you know. Prior to this change coming in, even though New Zealand citizens have a right to remain in Australia indefinitely, they're still considered temporary residents by virtue of the subclass 444 visa. And so they would have to apply for a formal permanent residence visa and hold that for at least one year to then qualify for citizenship. And it just never really made a whole lot of sense because, you know, effectively... It, it was just a, an application born of necessity, not really providing them with any greater benefit, although certainly some access to, to government subsidies, I suppose. So this just removes the need for them to get a stopgap before getting citizenship. So I think while they're on the 444, they're still a temporary resident for probably government employment purposes. I think that would be something for each government department to decide whether it wanted to adopt the same approach that immigration has adopted for the purposes of citizenship, if that makes sense. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so we've got two minutes before we hit 10 o'clock. Um, if there's no more questions, we'll credit you back two minutes in your calendar. And um, thank you so much for being so engaged. I know it was pretty intensive and, and heavy, but there was a lot to cover. Um, do keep an eye out um, over the next couple of months um, on the Mappium website, or if you're not on our mailing list, let us know. We've been um, popping out quite a few um, client updates and alerts over the last few months. Um, we will, as a group, be attending the National Migration Conference in October in Brisbane. And usually there are some Department of Home Affairs officials there that like to give us a few little tidbits on what's coming and when it's coming and what's happening. So um, once we get a bit more information, we'll be able to um, provide that in more detail, hopefully. But um, as Samantha said earlier, any questions, feel free to, to reach out to us or the team. And um, we look forward to um, helping you and, and working things out together throughout the rest of the year. Oh, and I've just eaten up one of those two minutes. <laughs> so I'll end there because everyone knows I like a chat.
and um, have an awesome day. And uh, thanks again for your time. Take care. Thanks, everybody.